rails might look simple, just two lengths of steel stretching across the landscape. But the shape of that steel doesn't just support the train, it steers it. It's one half of the most critical interface on the railway, where small changes in shape can have big effect on performance and wear. From the top of the rail to the foot that sits on the sleeper, every part of that profile is doing a specific job. In this video, we'll break down exactly why rails are shaped the way they are, how that shape affects train movement, and why it's still evolving, even today. When railways first emerged, the problem was simple. How do you move very heavy vehicles without destroying the surface underneath? Wheels sink, roads rut, but steel rolling on steel? That barely deforms, and that means it rolls with minimal resistance. That's why railways became the most efficient way to transport bulk loads over land. But the design challenge didn't stop with just choosing steel. Once you've committed to steel on steel, how you shape the rail becomes everything. Modern rails have a specific profile. Thick at the top, narrow in the middle, wide at the bottom. The head is where the wheel runs. It's shaped and sometimes hardened to take years of rolling contact. The foot sits in the fastening system and spreads the load onto the sleeper or bearer beneath. Between them is the web which connects the two and transfers the vertical load down from the wheel through the rail to the foundation underneath. It's not just there to hold it together. It's structurally critical in how the rail resists bending and transfers load. The shape as a whole acts like an I-beam, concentrated material where it can best resist stress while keeping the rail economical to produce and install. Let's focus on the top of the rail, the rail head. You might expect this to be flat on top, but it's not. It's carefully curved. Those curves aren't decorative. It helps shape how the wheel sits and rolls on the rail. When a steel wheel meets the steel rail under load, this is the contact patch. It's typically around the size of a coin. That patch is where all the force is transferred from the train into the track. It's also where the wear starts to happen. As the wheel rolls over, there's micro slippage across the contact patch, causing both the wheel and the rail to slowly wear and change their shape. And once those profiles shift too far, the interaction becomes less efficient and potentially less safe. So the rail head is curved to reduce the contact area, help the wheels steer and give engineers more control over how the contact happens. But not every rail design has worked out. At various points in railway history, engineers experimented with simpler, symmetrical rail shapes. Some early rails had a flat top, others, like double-headed rail, and later bullhead rail variation in the UK had a symmetrical top and bottom. Double-headed rails were designed to be flipped, but bullhead wasn't truly reversible. It had a similar shape but was installed in chairs that distorted the lower face. Flat top rails also gave a very poor control over the wheel. With no curved profile, the wheel had no opportunity to self-centre, and alignment relied almost entirely on the wheel flange. Modern rails are deliberately asymmetrical and deliberately curved because the shape makes everything else work. Now let's talk about curves and how rail shape plays a role. When a train goes around a bend, the outside rail follows a longer path than the inside one, but because both wheels are fixed to a solid axle, they have to rotate at the same speed. So how does a train steer without skidding or grinding? Part of the answer lies in the wheel. Most train wheels are conical in shape wider on the inside and narrower on the outside. This taper allows the wheel set to shift sideways as it moves, changing the rolling radius of each wheel. But here's the key. That only works because the rail head is shaped to allow that movement. The rail needs a gently rounded profile so the wheel can climb slightly on one side while dropping on the other. That's what allows the effective diameter to change and what keeps the train aligned through the curve. So wheel design matters but it only works in tandem with the right rail shape beneath. By the way, if you want to go deeper on how curves and track geometry work, I've put together a free guide to Canva. It's linked in the top right hand corner and in the description below. You've probably seen the flange, the small vertical lip on the inside of the wheel. Its job is to catch the rail if things start going wrong, but in normal running, it shouldn't be doing any work at all. Trains stay on the track, primarily through the interaction between the wheel's shape and the rail's head profile. When that interaction breaks down on tight curves, worn rails, or out of tolerance track, you hear the flange come into contact with the rail. That's the classic screech you hear as a train rounds a curve. 
It's noisy, it's inefficient, and it causes wear. That's why rail profiles are designed to reduce the likelihood of flange contact by making the head of the rail do more of the guiding. Of course, even the perfect shape doesn't last forever. Despite all that careful shaping, rails still wear over time. The repeated loading, especially on curves or at switches, slowly changes the contact surface. And when that happens, the interaction between the wheel and the rail gets worse. That's why the rail head is made larger than the contact patch. It provides that little bit of material to be worn or reshaped as needed. Rails can be reprofiled in situ using grinding or milling trains, restoring the correct shape without a full rail replacement. Then, in high stress areas, such as tight curves, the head might be made from a hardened steel to further resist wear and deformation. On those sharper curves, you'll often see lubrication systems installed, designed to reduce the wear between the wheel flange and the rail gauge face. It's all part of the long-term balance, performance, durability and cost. While mainline railways tend to standardise on a single profile across a whole route, not all railways use the same design. In tram networks and light rail, you'll see shallower profiles designed to integrate with road surfaces or tighter curves. On the other end of the scale, and not technically railway, crane rails are heavily reinforced to handle huge vertical loads at lower speeds and often have almost no web at all. The core principle is the same. The profile changes based on what the section of rail is expected to handle. But that's not the end of the story for a worn rail. When rails on main line reach the end of their useful life, they're not always scrapped. Instead, they can be cascaded, moved into slower, less demanding places like sidings, depots, or yards. In these environments, the reduced wear resistance and imperfect profiles aren't as much of an issue. It's a bit like a pair of jeans with a rip, no longer good for going out, but still perfectly fine for DIY. It's one more way the rail shape continues to deliver value, not just when it's new, but through every stage of its working life. Even though rails have had their current shape for decades, this doesn't mean they're a finished product. Modern simulation tools now allow engineers to model the wheel rail interface in even more detail, adjusting profiles, testing contact conditions, and predicting the wear rates. And those simulations have a real impact. One recent change to the AAR 2A wheel profile in North America, just a slight tweak, reduced wear by over 40% in testing. That's better for fuel efficiency, less maintenance, and a longer lasting system, all from a subtle refinement in shape. And that was just on the wheel. Imagine what can happen when you start looking at the rail itself as well. So why are rails shaped like that? Because they have to be. Every contour manages force, guides the wheel, reduces wear, and keeps the train moving smoothly, all while staying economical to produce and install. The shape of a rail isn't just traditional, it's the product of continuous engineering. And as we keep pushing for faster, heavier and more efficient railways, it's a shape that's still being refined. And if you want to take this further, I've created a full track components guide. It breaks everything down from fastenings to sleepers and how they all interact with the rail. You'll find that link in the top right now and in the description below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Drop a like, give me a comment below and hit that subscribe button.